Mountains are lonely places at the best of times. But in lockdown for the past year and a half, the feeling has been always one of isolation and very intense. The windmill blades rotated above me, their shadows sweeping the road and passing over my head with the indifference of someone walking across my grave. One day during the year, I was marching up an untarred path when I heard a car horn. A Toyota Hilux crept up behind, and I thought it was hooting at me. But it continued without slowing down, like a Taliban wagon on the road to Kabul, honking its way over every bump. The driver had bags of animal feed in the back, and sheep moved across the bogland, following the vehicle in a frenzy for their dinner. I waved, but there was no intimacy in the gesture. The lockdown had made us strangers to each other. Even a man in a white van servicing a windmill was more aloof than usual behind his steering wheel saluting me with his forefinger and a wary eye. And when a group of hunters appeared out of nowhere with a dozen dogs, they watched me passively and called their yelping pack from a distance. A hooded crow cawed his head off on a fence post, so forlorn that I wondered if my own unconscious shadow had thrown him into existence. I used to write about Warsaw at this time of year, January every year. I loved being there in the winter, on the streets in freezing fog, wandering from one shopping centre to another. Wearing, wearing a puffer jacket and a hood, with snow on my boots beneath the tables of quiet restaurants, as I ate my soup as slow as possible, just to prolong the conversation with some waitress. That's what I miss, talking to strangers, the dizzy fuss of busy shops and the magic of crowded trams. It used to be all so normal. Old women with little wheelie carts of cheap blouses smiled at me in TK Maxx, and young boys walked in their own dreams so deeply that they constantly bumped into revolving doors and then laughed it off. In optician shops, I chatted about very focals. In clothes shops, I sifted through waistcoats, and all along the aisles of computer supermarkets, I searched for assistants who spoke English. Even the most surprising things were normal. I remember brushing against a swarm of school children from Israel in a Jewish graveyard one day as they marvelled over old tombstones etched with their own names. And I remember a woman standing at the glass wall of a hotel foyer one evening as snow began falling outside. She smiled as she laughed into her phone and pushed her raven black hair back from her eyes and then suddenly she turned to me and asked me if I knew where the Théâtre Narodi was. We ended up having coffee in the great old chat and it was all so natural. I sat between women in scarves and fur hats in the churches and I ordered carrot cake for fun one day in a restaurant because the waitress said it was on special. I instantly regretted it, and she knew by my face. How do you don't like it? she asked, or laughed. Carrot cake is not suitable for this weather, I suggested. I loved chatting with other diners about pork and cabbage, cod bake with cheese or Russian pierogies, and I loved Milate's extra hot. I may have drank 
alone in my apartment watching Polish TV, but I carried every hangover all across the city on freezing ice, stopping to write wherever I went, in hotel foyers or coffee shops, in railway stations and on the train to Lodz. Because everywhere around me there were people, young and old, men and women, millionaires and destitute beggars, all of them close enough to embrace. But in the lockdown I could only walk out the gate and up into the barren hills, feeling grateful for a few kilometres of solitary mountain and the song of a forlorn crow that punctuated my loneliness. And that's been what it's been like for one and a half years, almost two years when March comes. And I look into this future year with COVID still a huge epidemic all around me. And I think about this loneliness, this way where I have become and you've become so isolated. We have had to privatise so much that was natural and spontaneous and engaging with other people. And I suppose in that loneliness, I got to reflect on who I was in a new way. And I began podcasting. And it surprised me how much faith I still had left. How much faith imbued everything I did, even though I might be considered an outsider to any official religion. But there's something about... Something about the idea of the monk, the solitude, that attracts us all. You know, we don't want to be lonely, and yet, and yet we're drawn into a solitude. It's like being a monk. I'm amazed. I, I think when I look back in my life, the, one of the most huge, important moments was when I was in my 20s and I was ordained a priest. And that rite of passage was so enormous and is still, you know, something very precious to me, even though, apart from four years in the official institution, I've lived a normal life, a married man, a happily family man, a, a writer, just getting on with stuff. And yet, on the inside there is some mark of that rite of passage that says there is another voice, an inner voice in every one of us that keeps calling us, keeps calling us away from the world to live in solitude on the inside. And it's not, it's not loneliness. Loneliness is the surface. When you break through your own loneliness, you find some kind of conversation is going on all the time. I know, I mean, I, I, I spent a lot of time trying to practice Buddhism. I don't do it very well. One of the great gifts I've been able to share with people is I'm no good at anything. And the realization that you're no good at anything, I think, can be a hugely helpful starting point in everything, in, in, in work, in relationships, in living your life, just to, to not be negative to yourself, but to accept your vulnerability, your failure, your, your imperfections. So there's a huge amount of value, I think, in the path that we have been forced into by COVID, and that is a path into a kind of a a monastic little space in our own hearts. And I, I feel that that's what came out of the podcast. I mean, I didn't expect to be doing a podcast. And when I started it, I thought I'll do it for six weeks. But here I am. I'm loving it. I'm on New Year's Eve of 2022. And this podcast is really about my direction in the podcast for the next 12 months. And I hope that, you know, you'll stay with me and enjoy the various personal reflections and meditations that I kind of throw out, and the stories. Let me talk story for a bit again, you know. Like, one of the big losses for me 
was that I couldn't tour. I had a book out before Christmas, a cloud with the birds rise, and normally I would be touring with that. I'd, I'd go up and down the country from Donegal to Kerry, from Wexford to Belfast. I'd do maybe, maybe 30, 25, 30 venues. And I used to really enjoy it because you get a great buzz out of talking ad lib to the audience, live audience, 300 people, and you're just chatting away to them. And you're reading a bit of the book and then you kind of go off on a tangent. And it's great fun. And I hugely missed it. And uh, the podcast is, is, a, is a substitute for that. Like, I had no problem standing on a stage and talking about my personal feelings. But there was always a part of me that never came out from behind the mask. A corner of my mind that required constant shelter. And that's why I love trees. They're a refuge. They provide me with a place to hide. And I'm lucky because years ago I planted dozens of them. I planted over 100 trees around our house here in the hills above Loch Allen. And now they've grown up and we have this beautiful little, tiny little woodland all around us. In the shelter of trees I experienced the universe as mother. I love the rustling leaves in summertime, and I sense their roots beneath my feet in winter. My only worry is that the trees are so big that they might fall on the house in a storm one night, especially when we live so exposed on the mountain. In fact, one of them did fall recently. I was really worried last summer because there was a branch of one of my huge big Chilean beech trees. Maybe, these are maybe 60 feet high, and, and one of the branches had grown out very heavy. So I could see the tree was beginning to become lopsided, and I thought, you know, if it falls, it'll fall on top of the house. And like an idiot, I decided to do nothing about it. It was August, and I thought, ah, well, you know, sure, it'll survive another year. It's not really going to fall. We didn't have any storms last year. But then this year, before Christmas, sure enough, there was a big, a big, big storm, and it broke off. And all I can say is that it feels like a miracle because it fell sideways. So it didn't fall. If it had fallen directly, it would have hit the roof. It fell sideways and missed the house. The slopes of the mountain are where I love to walk. Up the hills, across bogland and between the windmills, just to gaze at the ocean in the distance. On a clear day from the top of Arigna, I can see as far as Sligo Bay. Years ago, I knew a monk who came from Sligo. He inherited a farm of land when he was young, and he kept sheep for years. But one day, he just closed the door of his cottage and went off to a monastery and hid himself away for the rest of his life. I went to visit him once. I like watching monks, especially when they assemble in the middle of the night shuffling so reverently that they remind me of sleeping fish, and sometimes they prostrate in the shadows as if only God and not me were watching. One night I witnessed a monk stretched on the cloister before a statue of a saint, as if he were a log of wood, the cowl covering his head and his hands extending towards the plinth. Such medieval prostrations are long out of fashion in Christian churches, although the gesture of reverence persists in other traditions. But the word prostration conjures up such notions of self-abasement that I find it an uncomfortable act of devotion to execute. Even though it's considered common practice in many Buddhist meditation centres, stretching the belly, the knees, 
then the nose goes down to the floorboards. In an act of obeisance to any god, is like, it's like high-wire gymnastics for someone burdened with as much pride as me. Unless, of course, the prostration is done with a certain flamboyance, which inverts the gesture into a kind of show. I've tried this occasionally on the carpets of various shrine rooms, flinging myself to the floor with abandon, in the hope that anyone watching might conclude from such a firmly executed prostration that I was a person of enormous faith. After one such flourish, I remember a nun warning me against what she described as over-enthusiasm. One night a few years ago, I was lying in bed watching a monk on YouTube explaining how his conversion to the Coptic faith was brought about by a single prostration. This is a story I love and have written about and I must share it with you again. He was an agnostic academic for years, but one day he was drawn to an icon of the Mother of God in an Orthodox church, and almost without knowing why, he flung himself to the ground. Stretched on the floor before the icon, he then tucked his body into the fetal position and, according to himself, experienced a deeply mystical union with the cosmos. It was like being a child in her womb, he declared. I envied his dramatic spiritual awakening so much that I closed the laptop and rotated my body beneath the duvet, thus manipulating myself into a fetal position to see if I too could experience anything of this cosmic womb. But it wasn't my night. Nothing happened apart from the fact that the beloved woke up and I had to pretend I was doing yoga exercises. She was curious as to why I would be doing yoga in bed at that hour of the night, but I had no plausible answer. Perhaps it's just as well I didn't spend my life sheltering in a monastery, prostrating my way towards enlightenment. I'm happy enough to shelter in the trees, to shelter among the forests, and maybe those will be the cloisters of the future, reaching into the heavens and drawing their strength from Mother Earth. And if I do ever find some shy creature prostrating in the woodland before some noble oak tree, I will not consider them any different from a monk on the flagstones of a monastery, surrendering to the same exquisite mystery of just being alive. I love that story because, for so many reasons, I mean, I mean his phrase... When I heard this monk on YouTube talking about like he felt he was in the womb of the universe, he was in he was in the mother's womb, the the womb of Mary. It was the first time I really began to understand the sense of Mary's ascension into heaven, Mary's coronation in heaven, the sense of Mary really as a cosmic creature, mother of God. And the sense that my relationship with the trees and with the mountain and with everything around me w w was like as intimate as a baby in the mother's womb. And that was just one huge awakening for me. And I'm, I'm standing here at the minute. I'm, I'm, I have my microphone in front of me. I'm in my studio shed in the hills above Loch Allen and in the past five minutes, it's a quarter to ten on New Year's Eve, and in the past five minutes, the sun has broken through the clouds to the south, and it's slanting into the room through the, the Venetian blinds, and it's slanting across the trees just outside the window, and it's slanting across down on the lake, and above is the mountain Schlieveneeren, and above Schlieveneeren, a mist, a misty cloud, 
And, and, and there's something about finding a relationship with all this that's around me, which I think is the core of the spiritual journey. The parallel is like, is like the more I live on the inside, the more real I live on the outside. So, on New Year's Eve, I suppose I wanted to think about where I'm going. And something accidental happened this week. Without planning it, I went to visit a friend on Stephen's Day in Mullingar. And we decided to go for a walk. And we went to an old monastic ruins in Westmeath. Four, it's called Efawari. It's an old monastic ruins, and there's supposed to be miracles there. There's a spring. Now it flows like a river, but it flows, they say, up a hill. You can you can live with that whatever way you want, but that's the that's the folk tradition. And it's it's a hauntingly beautiful place. There's old you know, old ruins of twelfth century monastic settlement and underneath there somewhere that you can't see is the 6th, 7th and 8th century buildings that the old monks of the early Christian period would have been living in. There, there's a lovely roundhouse, there's remnants of this roundhouse in stone where they used to keep pigeons for their dinner. Remarkable, beautiful. So There's so many places there and it's haunting in the way that you kind of, your, your life on the inside begins to connect with life on the outside. You begin to get that sense of relationship that that you're you're loving the world around you and at the same time you're in your own monastic little space in your heart and it was so it was so strong that it led me to think more deeply about that idea of the spring and the living water and then the holy well and i ended up spending the week going from one holy well to another and I was amazed I was astonished I went to a holy well it's called St Patrick's Holy Well and it's near a place called the Holy Hill Hermitage which is a kind of Christian monastic centre over near Screen in County Sligo and it, the holy well is, is totally separate from it that was a beautiful experience and that is a that's a water with healing powers for people who have illnesses of the eyes. Okay, these are these are old cures, old traditions, old folklore, but they certainly have a poetic power. They ha I went from there then down to Saint Germot's Well, and Saint Germot's Well is near Port Runny on the Shannon, and finding the holy wells brought me into spaces in the country that I'd never been in before. And that was, a, that was an amazing little holy well near Port Ronnie, St. Germot's Well. And below that, a couple of miles, about 10 miles further south, I found St. John's Well. St. John's Well, south, it was just extraordinary. It's out in a big field with stone walls around it and all these wells I put up on my Twitter account, you know, images of them. And and from one well to another, there was something happening to me. There was, there was a sense that this is 3,000 wells or more all around Ireland. And, and that they're a kind of a map, you know. They're a map of the, the whole hidden Ireland, the Ireland of the old Celtic church. And when I'd stand at one of these holy wells... I'd be reminded of, of history that, you know, the sense of all those monks who came, possibly Coptic, 3rd century, 4th century, and they're coming across the Mediterranean or maybe up through Europe, but they're ending up on the West Coast in places like Skellig Michael and Killy Beggs. And, and they're bringing this Christianity with them and they're bringing meditation with them and they're bringing the whole sense of the hermit and the, the elder. Sometimes I read a fellow called John Cassian, you know, a very, very early father of the church, writing maybe in the 3rd century, 4th century, I'm not sure, but, 
but but his stuff is like reading is kind of a door into this period in the Irish church and then all those great centres of learning rose up the Book of Kells Skellig Michael and the Holy Wells were there then they were blessed by monks at that time saints at that time and then if you imagine you know the time of Cromwell that astonishing period that massive genocide where hundreds of thousands of people were slaughtered and and it was like at the time a very small population on the island so it was really really traumatic and then the outlawing of faith for so many long years in the penal days and then the famine and then in the 20th century what i'd call the age of the institutions you know where where the institutions it seems to me within the christian thing got just too tight and too too dominating and too repressive, oppressive. And yet, and yet, those holy wells. When I'm standing in some field, leaning against the stones of a well, I'm I'm leaning against stones that have endured all those times, one stone and another, little hut, you know, little beehive hut around the top of the well. And I'm standing there thinking, these stones have been here, this well has been here, endured all those periods in history, from the institutional 20th century to the famine, to the pre-famine penal laws, when there were secret holy masses being organized at those wells. And go back further, go back, be, way back into the history of the 9th century, 8th, seventh, sixth, those holy wells were there. And very likely many of them, or even most of them, before the Christians came, those holy wells were there, sacred streams to the Druidic tradition, and then blessed by Christian monks, affirmed in their life-giving poetry, and I could feel when I was walking from, no, I didn't walk now from one to the other, but when I'd be walking around a particular holy well, I went, to, there's a, a magnificent one in Ballinaglera on the Dower at Drumshambo Road, a magnificent, haunting place. It, it, it's like a whole, it's like a whole townland of holly trees. And there in the depths of the holly is this gorgeous, haunting, Holy well, known as Tubber Bioe, and Bioe would be E is, is Hubert in English, and Bioe is lively Hubert because he was a busy man, so to say, so the folklore says. When I'm standing at any of those wells, I'm thinking, did people come here for comfort during the famine? hungry did people come here for masses when it was illegal to practice your faith did people come here in the 12th and 13th century when the vikings had finished off and the whole whole celtic church was in decline and did people come here when hubert boe lively hubert w was there maybe moving around the area he had a dream you know of where he was going to die and be buried. And he had a dream of the mountain behind him with snow on it and in front of him the lake and just beside the lake a green patch. And of course that meant that he meant that meant his dream was telling him he'd be buried beside the lake with Schlievenir behind him. And he was able to point to it then and say there was a townland called Fahi and he said that's where I want to be buried. And he was buried there and that grew from that burial as a graveyard. That graveyard is still there in the townland of Fahi and people still in the folklore would 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 share the the, the belief that that's where B.O.E. Lively Hubert is buried. Him that died in, in the 6th century. 
and him then that would be walking around that holy well and listening to the gush and flow of that river. And I'm standing there, 1,500 years later. I'm taking a bottle of water, holy water from the well, as a symbol, as a poetry, to, to bless the house for the new year, to bless the world for the new year. To feel blessed, to feel I've touched this, this living water that comes out of the ground. So the, the holy well for me just, you know, it, it erupted. It erupted this uh, particular week accidentally. I didn't plan anything and yet suddenly at the end of the week it's Friday and I'm just, I've, I've wells. <laughs> I've been to about seven wells and, and I, think, I think I must find a few more because just even the notion that they're out there, you know, even when I look out the window and look, across the hills of Kilronan Mountain, to know that Lasser's Well is on the other side of it, or to know that, by the way, there's a one called Alva's Well, and it's, it's you'd go to Giva in County Sligo, it's the very bottom of County Sligo, and then when you walk up to it through the mountain, you, you, you're actually ending up in, I think it's, you're just on the border of Leitrim and Sligo. It's called Alva's, Tober Alva. A I L A I L B H E Tober Alva and oh well I was walking up it was four o'clock I was walking through the mist through the bog I was nearly afraid I mightn't find my way back and I had a fellow with me just as a guide and he was walking ahead of me and we were walking along Eventually we got onto a windmill road, which is great because actually the windmill road gets you a clean passageway towards the Holy Well. And it was like there was no chance that we'd see it. But he saw it. He saw the little a statue of the Virgin Mary in the distance. It was like an apparition now in the mist. Just on the side of a mountain with nothing more. I mean, if you were a stranger and didn't understand Irish culture... You'd be driving along, you'd say, what the feck is that? The, you know, the, the white figure, that very <clears throat> traditionally Irish, sort of garish, kitsch image of the Mother of God, but beautiful nonetheless, in the mist. And of course, that pointed the way, and we, once you went up there, you found this tiny, ancient well, beautifully covered like a beehive lid or, or hood on it. And beside it, beside Alva's beautiful well at the top of the mountain, a tiny building, a construct that must have been for a hermit. 1,500 years ago, up on the back of the mountain, beyond the windmills. And I'm walking there. And I'm, I'm thinking this mountain is, it will never be the same for me again, you know. Like instead of looking up now and seeing windmills on it, I look up now and I feel the energy of Alva, holy, holy monk of 1,500 years ago. And, like, here's a question. What, what was all this monk stuff about? Well, they had three stages, and this is explained by people who are better than me to do it. I've read it by, you know, essays by bishops and, and all sorts of, theological people within the Catholic tradition and they'll tell you that the monastic tradition was based on three stages and the three stages were purgat purgation, illumination and divination. So that the first thing you had to do was, was purge yourself of negative energy in life. This is exactly the same as, as what any Buddhist teacher would tell you. Body, speech, and mind are the three doors. Your body, your speech, your mind. Three doors that you close and block off the negative energy. The devil, you might say in the Christian church. Keep out the devil. It means simply in modern terms that you, you make your speech positive and loving. And you stop yourself using speechful ways to be negative. And mind is the same. It's simply that you just 
try and curb the negative, the negative and disturbing emotions that rise in your mind. All those negativities of jealousy and rage and anger and envy. I think envy is a huge one at the moment for people in the world we live in, you know. We could do an awful lot of envy in each other and think that's justified. But anyway, that that's all that negative thought you can, and feeling. You, you, you try and stop that. And then finally, obviously, body. You know, you don't do negative things. You know, if, <clears throat> if there was coins, if there was coins on the ground in front of a holy well, you wouldn't lift them up and put them in your pocket now, would you? To buy yourself a pint? No. Holy God, I'd hope you wouldn't. But negative energy, body, speech and mind. Purgation. Tibetan monk will tell me that's how to live that's the path towards enlightenment. Christian monk, 1,500 years ago, he's saying, she's saying the same thing. And, and here's the second, the second phase is, is the important one, I suppose, because it, it's simply like creating a vacuum. You know, if you empty the space, then the space is available for something else. So when you empty the space of negativity, you begin to get what's called, in Buddhist terms, realizations. You begin to awaken. You begin to become wise. You begin to experience the gift of discernment, you might say, in Christian terms. Just that, and it just comes. It's like it doesn't come from you. You don't make any effort to become wise. It's a strange way whereby something fills you if you empty the space and leave yourself available, so if you empty yourself of the negative emotion, the negative thought, the negative action, the negative word, you'll find your tongue begins to speak positive words because, I don't know, it just comes, it, it rises up and comes out of you. And you can understand how the Christians understood the Spirit, you know, the Spirit of God filling, filling you with wisdom. And and then the third stage for all those elder monks and wise gurus and lamas who've spent their whole lifetime dedicated to those sort of practices of meditation, of single-pointed concentration. Because, you see, the single-pointed concentration is what you need so that you're constantly in the present moment aware so that you're able to stop. So sometimes we, we say the wrong thing. And we have it said, it's out of our mouth before we realise it. And then we're thinking, oh Jesus, I shouldn't have said that. Right? So so your your mindfulness practice is allowing you to be vigilant. It's like your mindfulness is like the sentry standing at the door, the three doors, body, speech and mind. Your mindfulness is like some people do mindfulness now to lift from depression. Good idea. For mental health reasons. Good idea. But then some people do mindfulness because it kind of gives them a sense of self-contentment. It's always good to feel. But, but they don't apply any further purpose to the mindfulness. And I think that's where sort of Christian ethics comes in or, or Buddhist ethics. That the mindfulness of being aware and practicing various exercises of mindfulness, single-pointed meditation, whatever, that they're actually about being awake in the moment so that you can be vigilant against negative energy. So you can be, what Jesus might say, watchful. You know, be watchful. And I can understand how, you know, my friend, the, the Buddhist, or the, the orthodox nun would speak about that watchfulness being about the devil, you know, that, that be, be, be watchful that the devil doesn't get in. It mightn't be my language, it mightn't be the way I would put it as, you know, somebody in my confused modernity, but, but I can understand the clarity of that language that orthodox tradition uses about, you know, the devil, you know, keep the devil out. 
be positive. And it's, it's not actually generating your own positivity so much as just diminishing your own negativity and getting that down to zero. And that creates this kind of space inside you, this kind of consciousness space that then mysteriously wells up. And it, it, it's like, you know the way if you had a dirty well and it's all clogged up so you, d- you don't notice the well is there, you think it's just soft ground. And if you've got a spade and you started shoveling out all the heavy mud, shoveling, shoveling, shoveling until all the heavy mud is gone, and you'd see it filling up. It's a lovely experience then. You'd see, you'd see the water rising and gushing out from underneath. And I, I was at, I think it was um, Jermot's well during the week, near Port Runny on the Shannon. And you get all these, Google the, these holy wells, by the way, but I was at this particular holy well and it was so still and so clear, you could, you could see on the surface of the water, the way the light was shining on it, that the kind of mirror sense of the water was, was moving all the time like boiling water. You could really see the living water coming up out of the earth. And it was like experiencing the vein of a human being. The life blood of a human being. This is this is the life blood of this beautiful planet we live on. So I think this holy well is an extraordinary way of experiencing another ritual it's 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 like if the candle is a ritual for winter candle before an icon in the little private monastery of your heart then for me i think the holy well becomes the oratory of the springtime and it's one that i'm 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 hoping to see some more holy wells and to return to some of the ones that i saw this week and to just stand there and feel feel I'm in, in, in a presence, you know. See, the Holy Well, the Holy Well is a tradition. I talked about, we'll say, the three, there's three stages of what the early monks would be trying to achieve in their journey towards enlightenment. And the first was purgation, and the second was illumination, the sense of wisdom, realizations coming to you. And the, and the final bit of that is where at some stage the elder, the wise old woman or man, they just they just begin to experience God's presence everywhere. And that's available to you, it's available to me. Where you begin to say with the well there is nothing but God. When you look out your window, when you look at the birds, when you look at the when you look at other people. When you look at your beloved, when you look at your child, your parent, you realize there's nothing but God. All life is is out of the one source. Like all holy wells are out of one single source of earth. And when people go to the holy well, there's two ways to think about Holy Well. One is is like how effective and important it has been through history. So in those periods that I mentioned, like the what I'd call the institutional 20th century period or the famine period and trauma period or the penal laws period after Cromwell doing his genocide or going into the early beautiful times of the church from the 12th century onwards or, or maybe the really high point of learning and and art and creativity and the monastic hermits living all over the country from Killybegs down to Ventry as great meditators. You can look at the Holy Well and stand beside the Holy Well and feel the history of all those moments. But there's another way that the Holy Well is affecting you and that is tradition. So, like, tradition is when you step outside 
linear time and you enter heaven, you enter eternity. So in the Orthodox tradition, people would talk about the liturgy, the divine service, you are in heaven. You have, you've stepped outside the realm of the temporal and you are in sacred space, you are in sacred, timeless being. That's what's manifesting itself. That's the mystery of Christ. That is Christ alive. That's what happened in history. And it's not 2,000 years ago. It's what happened, but what is happening. It's, it's this eternal moment outside time. And, and everything is tradition. Everything belonging to that is tradition. It's living. It's living in eternity now. Well, that's an amazing kind of thing and a, and a, and a, a beautiful experience if you're at a, a great liturgy in the Latin Church or the Orthodox Church or, or wherever and, and you experience this sense of transcendence in the present moment and you realise that, that there's part of that ritual, that liturgy that brings you into eternity. It, it brings you across the threshold from temporal life. And then you begin to live that experience in your own solitude, and your own loneliness, so that you, you, you break across the threshold of loneliness into solitude, into the freedom of, of being inside your own heart and yet knowing that that experience you're having is God, is eternal, is, is outside time. And if that gets externalized in a really beautiful way, it does so at the Holy Well. Because the Holy Well is used. It is presently used. I haven't yet gone to a Holy Well that's not used by people going to it in the summer or even in winter, in groups, for prayers, or on their own for a bottle of water. It is used. You're, you're stepping into a living tradition. And in that sense, you're stepping into this sense of eternity. The Holy Wells give us this, this outdoor expression of being here now. A physical tasting of the living water. A sense of relationship with nature and the environment. It's like an outdoor church. It's like the Champel Tuhia, the people's temple. You know, great forests are, to me, the cathedrals of the future. So the little humble spring wells all across the country are also like oratories of divine presence. They offer me a chance to touch and hear and feel the living water of the earth, just as I feel the living water of the spirit inside me. This is the year, for me, of the holy wells. And this is New Year's Eve. And I'm wishing you a very, very happy New Year very happy and prosperous 2022. Thank you for being here. Bye-bye.